All right, let's go ahead and begin. Just because I am not there does not mean that you all can walk in late or keep talking or any of those things. I also want you to know that I am uh, that I am presently sitting in a room right now um, down in the basement of our church and I have bright lights in my eyeballs and uh, and it's cold in here and I'm saying all of that because that's where I am right now. When you watch this I will be not in the basement in a cold room. I will rather, uh, rather than that, be someplace warm and sunny. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So um, we are working our way through these series of Red Life Talks on marriage and family. And some of you by now are like, well, it says marriage and family, but so far it's only been marriage. And I'm assuming family would mean like maybe kids included in here and parenting in here somewhere. We've talked a little bit about that. And that's all by design. I mean, we do need to talk parenting, but but we've saved parenting more toward the end of these talks because you have to get the foundation laid first and then we can talk about parenting. And parenting is, by the way, incredibly important. But but you have to get the first couple of, the, the, the foundational principles sorted out first. And so that's really, really important that you understand that. So I have like, I think 10, I, I think I have like 10 things I want to, I want to tell you about parenting. I say, I think, because my math could be off. We'll see. We'll count them as we go. Um, but I have a couple of, I have some things I want to, I want to say about parenting. And basically I'm not going to be able to say everything, obviously about parenting that needs to be said. Uh, but the goal is rather to sort of put on your radar screen, the things that may perhaps be not as obvious. Um, and, and, and certainly some of the things I've kind of picked up on over the years of, of doing counseling and also chatting a bunch with uh, parents about their children. Uh, obviously, it's important to say when talking about parenting that you're going to need to scale some of these principles to the appropriate age of your child. For example, if your son is four, then you're going to need to take this instruction and make it appropriate for a four-year-old. If your son is 15 or your daughter's 15, then you need to scale it there. I'm going to try to help you with some of that, but ultimately you need to have the wisdom to sort of make sure that that, that is sorted out. So I want to basically frame this by, by here is... Um, Here's 10 things. Let's, let's, let's count. Oh, yep. 10. Here's 10 things. And if you know me, you know, there'll be some bonus stuff in here, but here's 10 things that your children need. Here's, here's 10 things that your, that your children really need. Now I'm framing it that way because we have all these, well, certainly our children have all these ideas of the things that they think they need. I think culturally, perhaps I mean, it's, a, it's, a, we live in a strange cultural moment in so many ways, but culturally we're being our, our kids and us as parents, grandparents, are being like pressed all the time on these are the things that, that, that our children really need. And yet the Bible has spoken into what our children really need. And we want to make sure that we're faithful to explore and to understand um, those things. And so I'm going to work my way through a couple of biblical texts here. Uh, you have a Bible in front of you, whether you know it or not, because there's one in the pew rack or you have one on your phone or perhaps some of you who are just all stars, like you brought your Bible with you. Uh, I commend you for that. Um, and so you can follow along here, but, um, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get going here, jump right in. So, so the first thing that I want to put on your radar screen that your children need, that, that, that they like really, really need, and these aren't exactly in, in any particular order. Um, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're randomized. So don't, you know, it's not like the first thing is the most important thing or, you know, but, but anyway, um, the first thing that your children really, really need, uh, is they need you to have a healthy marriage. They need you to have a healthy marriage. Now, the reason I point that out is because that's the whole point of everything we've been talking about so far is like, you know, in Ephesians 5, which you remember, of course, by now, the Apostle Paul tells us that it is not a husband's relationship, um, that it is, that it's not a father's relationship with his daughter or, a, or a wife's relationship with her son or her children that reflects the gospel, but, but rather it's a husband's relationship with his wife. And, and so, so what we see 
biblically is we see that God institutes marriage and he institutes family, but that the, the, that the ordering of those relationships are really important and that, that, a fa- that a husband's primary relationship is to his wife even when he is a father. That's really important that you understand that because what your children need most from you is for you to have a healthy marriage. And you will not have a healthy marriage if you prioritize your children more than you um, prioritize your marriage. Now, to be clear, it's a lot um, easier in so many ways to prioritize your children over your marriage. It really, it, it's so easy. And it's easy for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, our kids are really cute. <laughs> uh, they are also mildly annoying, meaning that when you don't prioritize them, they really let you know about it. And, um, and, and they cry if, depending on their age. Hopefully if you're 14 year old, you know, anyway, you can scale that one out, but, but, but they'll cry. They'll whine. They'll trip you. They will, um, you know, uh, they, they, they will do all of these things in order to say to you, uh, mom, or to say to you, dad, I am the center of the universe and I must be the center of your universe. And if I am not the center of your universe, I will let you know what, what, what an offense that is to me. And if you're not careful, what you end up doing is you end up going, this kid must be the center of my universe. Now listen, I'm not, we, we love our children and they are cute and they're awesome and they're great and, um, and all of those things. But you do not love your children well when you prioritize them over your marriage. You are not loving them well. And I would say, that one of the one of the bigger things I run into in counseling, especially with younger families, is is that it becomes much easier and seemingly on some level necessary to prioritize the children, to like keep them alive and stuff and feed them and work so you can clothe them and all those things. And all those things are good and you should do all those things. But somehow you had better figure out how to, in all of that, prioritize your husband and your wife and the condition of your marriage as central and um, and your children as secondary to that. You must do that. You must do that because God is glorified in healthy marriages. In, in order to have a healthy marriage, you have to prioritize it. And God is not glorified in unhealthy marriages. You must do that because your children will flourish as they watch a healthy marriage. And they will not flourish as they um, see an unhealthy marriage. Now, to be clear, I'm not making a guarantee there. There's just all these ideas out there, you know, and, and, and I'm not doing this right now, but you need to know I'm not doing it, and I'm telling you I'm not doing it so that you don't get confused as to whether or not I'm doing it. I'm not. But there's this, like, k- kind of pragmatic approach to, mar- uh, to, to, well, to marriage and parenting, actually, but to parenting, and it's like, oh, um, so some of you are sitting there, and you're like, oh, well, Alex is going to tell us, you know, between 10 and 35 things um, that we need to do for our children. And if we do all those things, our children are going to turn out awesome. Nope, that is not what Alex is saying. You might be onto something that I may have between 10 and 37, but you would be incorrect if you are hearing me guarantee you any outcome with your children. There are no guarantees with children. They're, they're human beings. They're living organisms. They're created in the image of God and they have fallen due to sin. And the result of that is there are no guarantees here. But your children are much more likely to flourish and have a healthy understanding of marriage if they can see that modeled in their home. Okay, that's really important. The other thing is about about prioritizing your marriage over prioritizing your children is that we are, and this is just a fascinating time in which we live, we are experiencing right now levels of um, narcissism in this um, generation from millennials down um, at a rate that we have I would argue, culturally never seen before. Now, that doesn't... Human beings have always wanted to be the center of the universe. Human beings have always been prideful. But there has always been, historically anyway, um, resistance to that. Resistance to that. There's been like a cultural resistance to that. There's been, um, hopefully, a desire to resist that in our parenting. And in the last few decades, we have run an really horrible social experiment called let's just affirm our children like crazy and see what happens. You know, so everybody gets a trophy. Let's see how that works. 
Everybody gets an A. Let's see how that works. Well, here's how it works really badly. Uh, don't even get me started on participation trophies, although I've already done that to myself, so let me sort of finish that thought. So what we've done in that participation trophy or everybody gets an A idea is we've made all of our children lazy because why would you even work? And then the ones that do work hard, like, you know, so the ones that work hard get an A and the ones that don't work hard get an A. So what we've done is we've diminished the value of getting an A. Now, I don't know much about getting A's. I told somebody, I think last week, that uh, I got one B, um, as far as I can recall. I think I got one B all through, um, it was definitely through college, um, and it might, high school might have been in there too. Um, so I got one B <laughs> all the way throughout high school and college, and that wasn't because the rest were A's. So I'll let you sort that one out. But, but, but when we're, when we're doing this, oh, Alex, uh, never takes a book home, he gets an A, and then like genius level, really hard type A, uh, you know, girl over here works her tail off, and she gets an A and we both the same, what we've done is we've made Alex more lazy than he already was and we're making this girl lazy too. And so that's that's the really bad cultural experiment we've tried and you need to make sure that you are not either knowingly or unknowingly feeding into that by allowing your children to think that they are the most important thing in the universe because they're not. And the sooner you can help them realize that, the better because I'm going to get to this later, you are raising an adult and I don't one of the thing, one of the reasons that, it, that that this generation of millennials and then the ones coming behind are really struggling in the workplace is because you get in the workplace and you've always been the center of the universe, but now you're like not because you have to start at the bottom of the of the pile and work your way up. And they don't the, the, some of these kids don't have a category of starting at the bottom and working their way up because they've always been the center. And as a parent, you have to make sure for a bunch of reasons, and that's one of them. But even more importantly than that, that God is glorified in that in um, through you prioritizing your marriage, because then God will be glorified in the lives of your children, and 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 they will be more likely to flourish and have proper understandings of actual healthy marriage. That's really important. First thing your children need is to see from you a healthy marriage. Second, the second thing your children need is they need um, they need authority. They need you to be their authority. Now, um, I'm saying that not because I'm some, you know, um, I don't know, old school, you know, weirdo. I'm, you know, I'm saying that because biblically, that's how the, the the Bible lays out the relationship between parent and child. Let me let me make that clear. Here's um, th- this is Ephesians chapter six and verse one. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. So like you're going to follow along with this or you're going to write this down or you're going to grab a pew Bible right now and look at it. You're going to pull it up on your phone. I need you to see this. So this is Ephesians 6, 1. It says this, children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother. So what you have out of the gate there, among other things, is you have the establishment of authority. There's an authority structure there. God is, our, is, is, is sovereign and, and has the authority over all. And under his sovereign authority, he places parents as, um, I think the language I've used on this is in the past is ambassadors, re- reflections and representatives of his sovereign authority to their children. So do you see that? So so it's God who commands through the Apostle Paul um, writing in the Holy Spirit that children obey their parents. So so it's God who says, who says, obey me. And then he says, parents, have your children obey me. And in that, it goes, there's a tiered level of authority there. Your children need you to be their authority because that is the way that the third part of this, which is discipline, but right now we're on number two, authority. The, the, the authority structure has to be there in order for discipline to be enforced. Your children have to realize that they are not the authority, that you are the authority. And that is really, really, really important because, because when, I, you know, right now I have a, I have a, so uh, I have a two-year-old, I have a four-year-old, I have a six-year-old, and I have a seven-year-old. So let's take the two-year-old. The two-year-old can't read and is also uh, rather disobedient, but also doesn't have all of the categories for understanding right now. So it's a little bit of a, um, it's it's a bit of an adventure at our house right now. But I don't say um, to my my two-year-old the next time she disobeys me, like I don't grab Ephesians 6 and hold it in front of her and be like, now Emma, listen, 
I want you to, Emma, turn to Ephesians 6, and then um, in your Bible, because I have mine, so you turn in yours, and then uh, begin reading in, in verse 1. So then she reads it, and, and I'm like, okay, so are you obeying me right now after she reads the text? Well, that's not how that works. Why? Because, because um, she can't read. So you want to know whose responsibility it is to ensure that my seven-year-old, my six-year-old, um, my four-year-old, four-year-old, and my two-year-old obey me? You know whose job that is? Mine. That's my job, to make sure and to ensure that they obey me. One of our memory verses that we teach our children really early on in the Tonicliffe house is Colossians 3.20. Um, uh, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases God. Now, my kids know that Bible verse, but, but it is my responsibility to enforce it. It is my responsibility to, to, to lay out clearly um, what I ask them to do, and then it is my responsibility to ensure that it is done. And that's really, really important that that is understood. Um, the, the rest of Ephesians 6 reads like this, verse 2, honor your father and mother. And then in parentheses, this is the first commandment with a promise. There is a blessing that comes from honoring father and mother. Um, so th this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. And then verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Authority is really important, and it's really important that you know you have it, and it's really important that your children know you have it, and it's really important that you operate within the confines of authority that God gives you. It's really important. And what I see a lot in, in, in watching parenting and in talking to parents, what I see a lot, I've seen this in my own life, what I see a lot is that we parents, um, once we understand that we need to have the authority, like we're like, okay, I, okay, yep, I need to be the authority. But then we do a bunch of things that actually undermine our own authority. And the problem is, is it becomes very difficult to discipline your children if you guys are eye level in their mind, right? That there needs to be a, a really understood, clear um, hierarchy in the home that it, that it is mom and dad are here and child is here. Not mom and dad are here and child is here, or God help us, uh, mom and dad are here and child is here, right? So, so, and it's actually really interesting to watch how even just culturally, like we have so elevated, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll kill children in the womb. We'll do that. But then once they're born, um, and by the way, obviously what an egregious, horrible, awful thing it is that, that we, that we've done all of those things. I mean, I, I don't want to sound at all flippant in that. I'm just making a simple observation. We kill children in the room in the womb which shows how little we actually value them and then once they um, get uh, come out of the womb we start to like glorify um, them in, a, in an unhealthy way and to affirm all of this wisdom and all of these things even to the point of letting them make all sorts of horrible life-changing decisions at six and seven years old. And that is actually, that's not, that's not even eye level at that point. That's children are above us. Like they're smarter than us. They're wiser than us. Let's let them choose their pronouns and them choose their gender and all of these things. And look, I'm just saying all I'm, the only, the, the point I'm making here is that, is that children are not eye level and they're not above. In God's design, children are to be under the authority of their parents. And parents, you do not want to be like, oh, yeah, I agree with all that, and then do things that undermine your own authority, which parents um, do a lot, a lot. Here's a couple of things that parents do that undermine their, their own authority. A couple of things not to do. Don't yell at your children. Don't yell at them. You're like, well, when I yell, I get their attention. Right. But also when you yell at them, what you're saying is, is I'm not your authority. Um, so I need to yell at you in order to demonstrate I'm your authority. That's bad because what you actually need to do, if, if you're your child's authority and you are God ordained, is that you need to speak to them. And when they don't listen to you, you need to walk into number three, which will be here in a second, which is discipline. But you don't raise your voice and start yelling because when you raise your voice and start yelling, all you're saying to them is, look, I'm not the authority here. So let me yell at you to try to ratchet it up. That's bad. You don't want to do that. You're teaching your children to actually disobey you. Number two, you don't want to repeat yourself endlessly. You don't want to repeat yourself endlessly. I'll just use like getting your coat on. Hey, go get your coat on. We're leaving. Kid doesn't move. Hey, get your coat on. We're leaving. Kid doesn't move. You're like, get your coat on. We're leaving. Now he looks at you but still doesn't move. You're like, oh, he must not have heard me. Get your coat on. You're leaving. We're leaving. And you just repeat, 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 repeat. 
that's bad. Because what you're saying is, I, I don't have any authority here, so don't listen to me on the first one. Don't do that. Just wait till I get to number 11 and then let's do it. That's bad. Don't do that. You're undermining your own authority. Here's another one. Um, <laughs> it always makes me sad when this happens. Um, but hey, get your coat on. Kid looks at you, doesn't move. And then you start counting. I think there's a ton of value to counting, um, to teaching your children how to count. Um, I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, I'm for it. Like, teach your children how to count. But when you start counting, one, doesn't move, two, doesn't move, three, doesn't move, whatever the number is, like, whatever, wherever, wherever you're headed here, I don't even know, um, before you step over there and take action, all you're doing to your child is when you say don't, when you say get your coat on, he's like, I don't need to listen to him. One, two, whatever the number is. And then when you get close to the magical number, before you walk over there or yell or whatever it is, then he knows. All you're doing is undermining your own authority. Don't threaten. Don't threaten. That's the other one. I mean, there's a bunch of these, but don't threaten. If you don't get your coat on, I'm going to come over there. That's not a good thing to, to do. Now, have I been guilty of these? Yeah, I have. Uh, I don't count, but I've, I've been guilty of probably all the other ones and a bunch more. And, and so I'm, I, I, th this is not a perfect parent telling um, imperfect parents how to be like me. That's not it. I'm just saying I've identified so many of these in the lives of others and in my own life. All of that, all of that undermines our own authority as parents. And here's the thing. We are preparing our children to, to um, follow God if they don't already. We're, we're, we're hopefully being used of God to accomplish it. And we're preparing our children to, to operate in society well. And to be human is to be under authority. And the sooner your children realize that, the better. Number three. Number three. Your children... Um, not only do they need a healthy marriage from you, and not only do they, do they need to know that they are under your authority, but they also need daily discipline from you. Daily discipline from you. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. So that idea of children, obey your parents and the Lord, that means when I tell you to get your coat on, you're going to get it on because I've told you to, 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 to do it. You're going to do it when I told you to do it. Um, you're going to do it because it's the right thing. And you're going to do it with the proper attitude. And if you don't do it when I told you to, or do it um, with the proper attitude, then there's going to be some level of correction or discipline that happens there. Um, and that that's you, you you have to understand that you have to. Um, here's uh, Proverbs. You turn over to to the book of Proverbs on this one. You got um, Proverbs uh, 22, uh, verse six. No, sorry, verse 15. Uh, Folly or, or foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. The rod of discipline drives it far from him. Here's Proverbs 23, verse 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, we would call that spanking, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will actually save his soul from from Sheol. And so the idea there is, is that God ordains discipline from a parent in authority over the life of their child. God ordains that. We are called to that. If you as a parent are not disciplining your child, you as a parent are being disobedient. You're being disobedient. Now, um, that's really, really important it, uh, because you're actually disobeying God. And the other thing about that is, is that God disciplines us. And he disciplines us, this is Hebrews chapter 12, he disciplines us because he loves us. So, so what that means is, is that if you do not come under, according to the mind of the preacher to the Hebrews, if you do not come under discipline when you err, um, if you do not come under divine heavenly discipline from God when you err, you're actually not one of his children. That's that's the reasoning of that. You can go read Hebrews 12. I've been preaching on that. Um, it's really important that you understand that. Because basically, here's how it goes. Uh, you know, I'm out at the store or at church or whatever the case may be, and my, my kids are with me. And um, we're, you know, walking down the aisle, say, at Walmart or something. And, uh, and this kid, th somebody else's kid over here is freaking out and having a meltdown. And somebody else's kid over here um, it just disobeyed when their parents said, get over here. And in both of those instances, I don't walk over and go, hey, can I take care of this one for you? And then I, I don't discipline those kids. They're not my kids. 
But when my kids have a meltdown at Walmart or when my kids are told to come over here and they don't, I have to bear the responsibility as the authority under God's sovereignty to bring about discipline in the life of that child. I have to bring about that discipline. Now, it's important because when we talk about spanking, and spanking is a biblical thing that you should do. You should do it. Now, again, your 15-year-old, no. But your four-year-old, yes. Okay? Um, I'm at this moment in time just anticipating the, the pushback in the emails. Uh, but we'll say it, we'll say it because, because this is where the scriptures land on this. Discipline by way of, of spanking is a gift um, from God to parents to use to bring about godliness, to drive out the folly that is in the heart of their child, right? I was um, asked this question one time in, in kind of a group about spanking, and it was it was actually asked, I want to say, I think it was in the context of a panel. I think I was sitting on a panel discussion for some reason. And the question came up about spanking. And when you're on a panel and you don't know the other people on the panel, you're like, well, this could be weird. So like a couple of the other speakers took a shot at whether or not you should spank. I think one person said no. I think another person said um, something like, you know, I was spanked when I was little, but, but with my own children, I've, I've decided to not work on behavioral modification, but rather to address their heart. And so kind of like, you know, made this idea out of spanking is that spanking is just behavioral modification, but, but this person wants to go after the heart. And then it was kind of, quiet. And I was like, well, this will be awkward. So I said that the wisest man ever to live, which is Solomon who wrote Proverbs, the wisest man ever to live said that foolishness is bound up in the heart of your child and that it is the rod of discipline that will drive it far from them. So we don't want to come up with some kind of caricature of spanking, that it's just behavioral modification or that it doesn't address the heart. The fact of the matter is, is that it's a tool that God has given parents to leverage um, in order to bring about obedience in the lives of their children. Now, some of us were spanked um, in really horrible ways by angry mom or angry dad, and it was inconsistent, and it was full of anger and it was perhaps over the line and we have this idea then that says, oh, we shouldn't spank. Um, that is not the right reason to not spank. Just because you were spanked the wrong way does not mean that you shouldn't spank. It means that you need to spank the right way. It's very important that we make a distinction at this point between uh, correction and discipline. Okay, we have to make a distinction between correction and discipline. Correction is my son has got something he 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 um, he, he got something wrong. Like so, for example, um, let me think. I'm trying to think of an analogy here. Uh, you know, I I asked Owen to go put my hat uh, on the counter, and instead he put it on the kitchen table. Well, I don't spank him for that. Um, I'm trying to teach him how to put his clothes in the dirty laundry. And he uh, accidentally grabs, you know, he takes clothes out of his drawer, which are clean, and puts them in the dirty laundry, which happens. I don't spank him for that. That's not rebellion. He just, he just needs correction. Hey, Owen, um, the kitchen table is not the counter. I asked you to put my hat on the counter, can you know, and when we go do that. Hey, Owen, uh, dirty clothes go in the hamper, not clean clothes. That's correction. That's just, you know, um, hey, Owen, can you get me a drink of water? And he spills it on the way over because he's four. I don't spank him for that. I don't even, uh, he, he's four. So, so we have all of these, right? So we're not talking about spanking in any of those. What we're talking about when, we, when, when, when Proverbs is referring to this rod of discipline that needs to be used, what we're talking about there takes us back to Ephesians 6. I have given you clear instruction. Well, first of all, you're not 17. Okay, so there's that. But, but in, in my context with my children um, and your children, depending on their ages and all of those things, um, I have given you clear instruction. Number one, it was clear. 
And like, I've even had to work on my language, especially when my children are much younger, to make sure that I'm speaking to them in the clearest possible way that I can. I'm not muttering, I'm not using confusing words, I'm not, I mean, it's, I'm trying to get really on their level. So, so it was a clear directive that I gave to them. That's one. Two, they heard and understood my directive. Three, they defied or rebelled or disobeyed the directive that I gave them. In that instance, now spanking is on the table. Short of that, keep spanking off the table. It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not an option. If you weren't sure, if you didn't speak clearly, if they didn't hear you, if they didn't outright defy you, um, you spanking is not even a, 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 an available option. But once those things have happened, now spanking is an available option. And I would tell you that if those things have happened, I think you, at that point, I think the Bible makes it clear, walk into now now the the, the realm of, of, a, of a spank in there. And, and here is how that needs to go. I want to tell you exactly how to do that. Um, I, I've actually refined uh, the art of this over a few years. I, um, I, I taught on this, I think, back in like 2018. If you're looking for any more teaching on parenting, it, it was um, under the heading of, uh, uh, we called that series, um, I think, Parenting in the Glory of God. And, um, and I've even refined... <laughs> More, more children will do this. I've refined the art of, of doing this in what I believe is the best, most biblical way, uh, even since that talk. But you can go listen. Those were sermons, not talks. You can go listen to those. But, but here's how it needs to be done. So um, the first thing I'm going to do when, my ch- when I'm aware of the fact and my child is aware of the fact that they've disobeyed me is the first thing I'm going to say is, let's go to your room. Um, you should never spank your, your child in front of the other ones. You should never spank your child in, in public. You should never uh, do it in gospel community group. None of those things. Spanking needs to happen um, in solitude with just you and them. Otherwise, you bring about shame and embarrassment. You don't want to do that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to your room. The second thing we're going to make sure of is that I'm not angry. Now, I'm a sinner, to be clear, in case you didn't know that, and so are you. And so you never, ever, 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 ever spank your child when you're angry. Never. Ever. So I need to make sure that my emotional temperature is, is, is where it needs to be. And if it's not, I need to go talk to the Lord, confess my own sin of anger, and get this thing sorted out. So we're going to your room. I am emotionally calm and not angry. They are not angry. That's important, okay? I'm going to say to them, um, do you know what you did that was wrong? And they say, yes. What did you do? Well, I I disobeyed you. I didn't do the thing you asked me to do. Or I did it with a bad attitude. Okay. So I want to make sure that that's identified. Okay. So you did that. You did that. That was wrong. You disobeyed daddy. And what that means is, is that daddy's going to give you, and then this is what I'll say, daddy, d- depending on the offense and, and all, all of those things, I'm going to say, daddy's going to give you three swats on the bottom or, or two swats on the bottom. I'm going to tell him how many. Um, and then I'm going to say, and if you fight me, because I, I have a couple of these, you know, if you fight me on this, um, you're going to get an extra swat if you fight me. Because, you know, my boys especially, well, one of them especially, is not terribly keen on spankings and um, will do anything short of jump out the window to, and, and we've had to really work on that with him. And so, so, so he knows a bonus one's coming if he doesn't calm down. And so then I say, you know, put your hands on the bed. So his hands aren't back there. Put your hands on the bed. And then I um, swat his bottom. I use my hand. Um, I know, uh, Somebody back in like the 80s was like, don't use your hand because you want your kids to know um, that your hands are there to love them. But they were like, but spank them, but just use an instrument. And I'm like, well, when my dad was holding the paddle, I knew who was holding the paddle, right? <laughs> so it's like, I'm not so concerned about that. Uh, you just need to be very loving as you do this, and which is to say not angry. And your kids, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about, about, about that. But if you are, fine. Um, I like the control that I have using my hand. And so that's, that's what I do. And then I give them the amount of spankings that I said that I would. And, um, and those, that, that, 
well, I'll save that to the end. So, so that happens. And then they cry. And um, I used to leave them, and this is, I think, what I said earlier uh, in when I taught on this before, is that I would like sometimes leave the room and let them calm down. I don't do that anymore. Um, it was, it actually worked better with one of my children. It doesn't work as well with the others. And I, I actually would say stay in the room. And so what I do is I stay in the room and my son, uh, I keep defaulting to sons and that's because they get more. Uh, my son will sit on my lap and I will hold him and I'll say, I love you. I never want to spank you again. I spanked you because you disobeyed me. And, and I'll say, you know, you, you know what you did was wrong. He'll ask for my forgiveness. I say, I forgive you. And then we walk out of the room together in the punishment is done. God, in his kind, sovereign grace to me, has chosen to not hold my sin against me. He, the Bible says that he chooses to forget it. I forget that. We're done. It is over. We will leave this room joyful. We'll actually leave the room with more joy um, going out of it than we did going into it or before we had it because, because we are going to make sure that we're restored. Now, the reason I like that is because this whole Punish your kid by just being tick, ticked off at, t- ticked off at them is bad. Um, t- timeouts. I'm not saying there isn't a place for a timeout on occasion, but 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 the nice thing about a spanking is is that it is that it is it is defined. It happens. There's restoration, and we're moving forward, which is exactly how the discipline of God works. Where there's, you know, we sin, um, we seek God's forgiveness, we're restored. That's how that works. And so the the, the nice thing about a spanking is, is it actually models the gospel and grace really well in that way. That these other ideas of timeouts and you know just be mad at your kid all day and be short with them all day. That that's God. God doesn't operate that with us like that with us. We shouldn't do that uh, with our children. So. So that's really important that, 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 that you, that you spank your children is important and that you do it in the right way. It's really important. Let me say one thing about this. Um, I would say that the spanking, what I've, what I've, the idea I've used there is that that spanking, that, that moment in time, it needs to be memorable. Now, when I say memorable, I don't mean that you keep bringing it up. I, I mean memorable for your children. Um, I think I've shared this story before. I'm not sure. But um, I had a mom talking to me once about uh, her her uh, son, I believe it was, um, was hitting her and like hitting everybody else. And I was like, well, have you spanked him? And she's like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we spank him. And, and he just keeps on hitting. I'm like, oh, interesting. So I asked some more questions and gave some thoughts and try this. And um, and then it just so happened that later on, uh, I mean, this was some time later, but they were over at our house. And I don't remember which of my kids was the target of this, but but that kid, um, that, that son, um, just leveled one of my kids. And uh, I wasn't terribly concerned about it. It's like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going to discipline that kid, the, their kid. So I was watching to see how my son would respond. And like he got back up and whatever. But, but then I watched that mom um, pick that kid up. He probably two. Picked him up. And, uh, and as she was like picking him up, like she was like, no, no. And she gave a little like swat on his butt uh, through, and he was wearing a diaper. So it's like, you know, no, no. And then she like sets him back down and he like runs off. So it was like one fluid motion, picks the kid up, swats the butt, sends it, you know, it's like touch and go with an air. I mean, that, that's what that was. And, uh, and so I, I, I let that play out. And then later, I don't, I, I think it was um, in a subsequent conversation. They were friends, they're, they're friends of ours. And so I said, so when you say you spank your son, is that what you meant? And she's like, yeah, that's, yeah, I spanked him. I'm like, your son doesn't actually know he got spanked. Like he has no memory of it because you, you, and, and that was the end of that. So then she started making those occasions and, and the, the, the kid's dad started making those occasions of spankings more memorable as in you can feel it. It should hurt. If it doesn't hurt, it's provoking. It should hurt. And as they started doing that, there was a significant change there in, in the behavior of, of that child. And so that, that's what I'm talking about with it being memorable. It's not that. Like, like if, like if, if I spanked you, if, if I spanked one of my, <laughs> if I spanked one of my sons, um, this morning, uh, when I got home tonight, and I would never do this, but if I did, when I got home tonight, if I asked them, did you get a spanking today? They remembered it. They remembered it. It was memorable. It hurt. There was restoration. It was significant and memorable. And that's what that uh, discipline uh, in, in the form of spanking needs to be. Um, and then there needs to be restoration. And that you will see over the course of time will transform um, the behavior uh, of your children. And this might sound arrogant, but here's the thing. Um, the eye test on this one, um, I, I could tell, I, I'll, I'll, well, I'll say always, 
how about this? Almost always, but hear me say always, um, you can tell where, it, where, where, where there is that kind of loving discipline as it, and a tool of which is spanking in a home. You can tell. You can tell. Um, and you can tell where uh, there's no discipline or, you know, timeouts or, you know, um, whatever else. You can tell a difference. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that my children are perfect. If you've ever seen them, you know they're not, uh, which is why they still get spankings and, and, and all of that. And, and that's why I, I'm saying that your children need daily discipline. This is a daily thing that needs to be done, and you need to be very consistent and, and play the long game on this one and be after those children. And so, uh, so that's, that's really, really important. Um, so let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, and we'll come back from break. I hope you'll come back, um, and then we'll uh, we'll get to these other ones. We're obviously going to start to move a lot quicker, but those foundational things are really important. So grab a break, uh, five minutes, and then we will get back at it. Okay, so you're back. I'm back. We're all back. It's good to see you. Um, Thanks for coming back from break. I'm going to start moving quicker now, and uh, and and I need to start to 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 actually really speed up. So let's 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 do it. So the fourth thing your children need from you is they need God's word, which is another way of saying they need to be discipled. They need to be discipled by you. Discipline is actually simply discipleship. That's what it is. We call it discipline. Um, obviously, the words are similar. If you've ever tried to spell them, like you'll notice, hmm, there's some similar uh, letters here. Yeah, discipline, discipleship. So so your children need God's word, and they need God's word um, from you as their parent. Now now listen. I say that because there's a bunch of us who think that, um, that like we, you know, buy our kids shoes and we send them to school or homeschool them or whatever the case may be, but that like God's word stuff, like that's for the professionals. So like Pastor Alex, you tell my kids God's word and Miss Shirley, you do that. And, and he's, you know, Abe, our youth pastor, you do that. No, no, no. Your children need God's word from you. It's really important. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is Moses uh, speaking to the children of Israel. They are getting ready to go into the land. He's kind of preparing them to go into the land of promise. He says this, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Verse 6. And these words that I command you today, which is the law, God's word, God's revealed word, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them, you parents, teach them these words, teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you get up. Your children need to be saturated in the Bible. You need to do that. Now, I'll do that too. That's God's call on my life is to preach the Bible, among other things. So I'll do that on Sunday morning. But if you think that's enough, you are woefully, woefully mistaken. If you think that that letting Alex, I mean, your kids don't pay attention to me anyway, and you sort of do sometimes. So if, if, if the goal here is my children will be discipled um, on Sunday morning from, you know, whatever service we go to by Shirley or Alex. That's bad. That is not it. The, the, the text is explicit here. Parents, teach these things to your children all the time, all day. Like, you are doing this all day. You're going to talk about God's word when you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, whatever you're doing, you are reminding your children of God's word. You're doing it all day, every day day. Really important. There's a bunch of, there's a couple of ways to do this with your children practically. You need to read God's word to them. You need to help them memorize God's word. That's, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. You need to teach them God's word. You can listen to God's word to them if you're not a reader, which don't get me started on you who say you don't read because you just probably do. But but now, I mean, there's even options to, to listen to God's word together. There's all these options. But the point is, is that all day, every day, as a parent, you are saturating 
treating your children in God's word. Now, let's make a fairly obvious observation, um, but it may be so obvious that we don't that, that we wouldn't naturally make it. You cannot give what you do not have. Can't. Can't. You will not saturate your children in God's word unless you are saturating yourself in God's word. Can't do it. Won't do it. So the whole point here is, is when I'm driving my children to school, which my kids are homeschooled, but you'll get the analogy. When I'm driving my kids to school, when we're hanging out in the house, when we're watching a movie, like, I'll do that when we're watching a movie. Like, well, that's not right. You know, you know, what, whatever. When I'm putting them to bed, we're working on Bible verses. We're talking about God. We're working on scripture memory. We're reading the Bible. We're listening to the Bible. We're doing these things all the time. And if you aren't doing that as a habit in your own life, it will not overflow into the lives of your children. Your children need God's word and they need it from you. That's number four. Here's number five. Your children need you to raise an adult. Okay, your children need you to raise an adult. What I mean, now you're like, well, my kid's a kid, right. But he's also going to be an adult, Lord willing. So raise an adult. What I mean by that, there's a bunch of things I don't mean. I, can't, I don't even have time to go into those. But, he, but, but here's, here's what I mean. I, I, if, if you're raising a future adult, then what you need to do is be an adult in order to raise one. And what that means is, is that you need to be able to see what your children can't see. That's, that's important. Like, you need to see down the line and go, because right now, you know, your seven-year-old, that, um, interesting. Uh, if something lights on fire, just we'll stop the tape and apparently that'll be the end. But anyway, if you're, if you're seven-year-old who can't see what you see, your seven-year-old never wants to be disappointed, never wants to be let down, never wants to hear no. Well, you know what life is? Disappointment, right? And as a parent, you better start giving your child categories because they're going to be an adult someday. So raise an adult, Ra raise one, right? Really important. And, and so, so, so basically, c kind of the idea I'm getting at here is that well, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, c c sort of this idea of like you as their parent sort of diagnosing them by the grace of God, like, like running a diagnostic on them to like, sort of like begin to understand and to pray about and to search out and to talk to them about like the way that they're wired. Meaning, what are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? And it's crazy how often those things go together and, and, and you are like shepherding them, discipling them, shepherding them to, to, to walk in their strengths, surrender to the grace of God and, and to, to um, acknowledge weaknesses and to help them work some of those weaknesses out. Like you're seeing that all the time and you are preparing them to be a godly husband, a godly wife, if that's what God has for them, a godly adult, a follower of Jesus. You can't make your children um, obey Jesus. And I would really encourage you, avoid doing that. Avoid trying to make your children obey Jesus. You can't do that, but you have a part to play in this. And part of that is you need to be an adult and raise one. You need to raise an adult. Really important. Really, really, really important. Um, I talk to people all the time who, you know, especially in premarital counseling, some things like that. And it's like, man, I really wish that your parents would have equipped you better. And, and look, I, that's no sh shame on those parents necessarily, but we sometimes, sometimes you're just in the trenches, you know, fighting for your life. And it's like, we can easily forget, this is a future adult right here. My four-year-old is going to be 40 someday. You know, my 15-year-old is like going to be 20 tomorrow, you know? So, so you got to keep that in mind and really stay vigilant on that. Really stay vigilant on that. Number six, your children need you to model confession. They need to see you model confession, repentance, and forgiveness. What I mean by that is, is that your children need to see you and hear you approach them and say these words. Daddy was wrong when I raised my voice with you. Please forgive me. Will you please forgive me for that? I remember, um, I, I just, d d you know, just a little confession time here. Um, I can just get in lo what I call like low boil mode. You know, I don't. Even, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but um, but usually when my kids are um, are being kids, uh, sometimes I, I just get in low boil mode where it's like everything starts to annoy me. Everything. It's like you're just being a kid, and I'm just getting annoyed. 
Listen, if your kid being a kid is annoying to you, they are not the problem. So, so I get in these little low boil modes and I started to realize that like low boil is sin. Can my kids tell? No. No. They can't tell. For the most part, they can't tell. My seven-year-old is, I mean, is, she's starting to pick up on some stuff. I actually wish she was a little less observant but um, uh, sometimes, but, but, uh, but she's starting to pick up on it. But I remember the first time I ever was convicted about low boil mode, and I just sat down. I think I only had, I might have only been Haven and Judah at the time, and they were little. And I just said, guys, um, Daddy has been a little frustrated and, and angry tonight, and that's wrong. Will you please forgive me for that? And my, my daughter, just cute, just, you know, smiles at me, kind of wrinkles her nose and goes, Daddy, you haven't been bad tonight. Like, Daddy, you haven't been bad tonight. No, I was. And she couldn't even tell. And that's not the point. The point is, is not wait for your four-year-old to confront you. Like, that's like, uh, Father, um, four-year-old permission to speak? Yes. Okay. So, Dad, uh, in my running diagnostics on the heart posture that you have brought into the home from work, it seems to me as though you may be carrying some of um, maybe some stresses, Dad, some of those things, perhaps even a little idolatry. Maybe you're finding your identity too much in how your day at work went today. And I just need to like gently nudge and press you on the fact that um, that is beginning to boil over and I can sense some frustration with me. Am I reading you right, Dad? Uh, yes, four-year-old, you got me nailed. Like, four-year-old's not going to say that, but you know that. And you better be very careful. Like, some of us on number five are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to diagnose my kids. Yeah, you also better diagnose your own dang heart and stay on top of it. And when it's sinful, whether your kids realize it or not, begin to acknowledge and walk in confession and repentance because in that, you are creating categories. Not only is it the biblical thing to do, if you sin, confess it to them. If you sin against them, confess it, whether they, whether they can see it or not. Um, four-year-olds aren't exactly astute about much things. If they're hungry, that, you know, they, they might realize that if we're lucky. So it's like, you need to own that though and begin modeling that and and um and 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 I can't tell you how memorable it was uh as I was growing up the times of and there was a bunch of them where my dad would just acknowledge that he was was wrong and would ask for my forgiveness like really significant moments um for me and and and, and we need to make moments like that not for the sake of their significance primarily but because it's right and good and obedient to do and the outworking of that will be significance in the lives of our children. Um, you need to show uh, your children uh, love and respect. Um, you need to show them love and respect. Uh, so, so show them and tell them that you love them and show them and tell them that you respect them. A little bit of last night, your five-year-old son runs off of the same fuel as you do at 45. Respect if you're a dad. Your, and, and I, I don't have the time to over nuance that. You, you, you remember that from last week? Your six year old daughter, mom, runs off the same thing you do love. And so, so show them and tell them love and respect. You are giving them categories for love and respect, whether you, whether you know you're giving them those categories or not. You are giving them those categories, whether you know it or not. Show them and tell them love and respect. Number eight, your children need protection. They need protection. They're children. They need protection. They need you to protect them from a lot of things, but a few to think, to be aware of you, that they're in the, the internet. You need to be watching. What are they watching? Um, music. What are they listening to? Social media, which is like the most dangerous drug in the history of humanity. And no one, I shouldn't say no one, but we are aware of it. Uh, and, and social media companies are aware of it, but there's too much of this in it. So the result of that is, is that there's all sorts of damage coming our children's way due to, um, these, uh, really dangerous things. And there's so many parents who are just out to lunch on it, like out to lunch on it. Your 14 year old has a cell phone. Like, what are you doing? In addition to that, has a cell phone with no filters on it, no nothing, a laptop in his room with no filters on it. That's not protection. That's not protection. Uh, I think this is a helpful analogy because what I'm not saying, and some of you are like, oh, you know, uh, He's just a, he's just an old school, 
you know, whatever. I'm not saying <laughs> that you uh, dig a moat and um, fill it with water and put a fence around your house and fortify it to keep all the dirty sinners out. That's not what I mean by protection because your children are sinners. So you can try to keep them out all you want. They're already there because you're there and so are your children. So I'm not talking about that. Don't, don't um, caricature me in this talk as somehow protection means, you know, oh, Alex doesn't use the internet or have a cell phone. I do both of those things. But there is a required amount of protection in um, that you need to provide for your children. And the analogy I'll give is, is the difference between a gun and a grenade. So, so both of both a gun and a grenade to be uh, to, to to actually operate, there's an explosion that is required. But with a gun, the firing pin hits the primer. The primer detonates, ignites the powder. Uh, the bullet um, begins to fly out the barrel because it can't go anywhere else. That's the whole idea. And the result of that is, is that while a gun is dangerous, uh, there it, it, it is a it is a tool that can be used, and there's benefit. Um, e even, even though the danger's close. Uh, that is very different than a grenade. You do not want to hold a grenade in front of your face while it goes off, but you can hold a gun. You don't want to hold a grenade in your hands while it goes off, but you can hold a gun. And so the whole idea there is, is that we're not trying to protect our children from literally everything because we can't do that. So there's a way in which we want to actually let little controlled explosions happen in front of us and watch how our children interact with them. Right? Because otherwise, you, you, you swing over into Moatville, you know, dig the moat, build the fence, all that. You can't keep the outside away from your children forever. And it's actually the inside of your children that's the problem. So there's actually some benefit in letting some of what's inside of them come out in a controlled way. Right? And, and so that's really important. And, and that analogy needs to get worked out a little farther. And we're out of time on that analogy. If you have questions about it, talk to me. But, but that idea there of letting some of these things begin, begin to come out, I think is, is really important. Um, you know, uh, I, I know I've, I've met parents, especially growing up, who like wouldn't let their children watch any movies, you know. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. Now, there's a bunch of movies you should not let your children watch. But no movies is not great. And what will happen occasionally when you're watching a movie with one of your children is you'll get to see inside of their heart in some ways that will sometimes be really discouraging and in some ways that will sometimes really be encouraging. And so same with listening to music. I mean, any of those things, those are all opportunities to kind of look in there and see what's going on and have um, what, what, what I'm calling here like this kind of controlled explosion, but to sort of see what's really uh, going on. Um, we were watching the new... Uh, Top Gun the other day. We've watched it a bunch of times. Some of you are like, oh, I'm leaving the church. You watch this Top Gun. Okay. Um, great movie, in my opinion. And, uh, and there's, there's this frame in the movie where, uh, where our boy Tom Cruise um, is teaching the fighter pilots, you know, how to fly this mission. And, and, and the camera pans to him um, really dramatically. And he goes, time is your greatest enemy. And we're just sitting on the couch. And my six-year-old, like, three down. Um, it's like me, Melissa, Emma. Judah on the end. Judah goes, um, actually, sin is your greatest enemy. I'm like, that's decent theology, son. You know, that's pretty good, right? Um, he, to be clear, not everything that Judah says is that profound and uh, or true uh, or encouraging. A bunch of it is discouraging. But what I, as a dad, am able to do is shepherd off of that. And so the whole point is, is that you want to be able to, in age-appropriate ways, all of that, be able to see what's going on in your children's heart and shepherd that. And, and, and there is a way in which media and books and some of these other things, entertainment, can be used to actually do that well and there's other things that are just catastrophically categorically off limits and you got to figure that out you got to figure that out okay number nine um, it goes without saying uh, your children need Jesus they need Jesus really bad really 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 bad and if you don't see that the, the, that the reason that God Almighty has entrusted your children to you is so that you can point them to his son then you are out to lunch absolutely 
out to lunch. And so you have to figure out as a parent, how am I going to leverage these years I have with my child to, of all the things I need to do, of which there are many, how can I primarily and principally in all of it be pointing them to Jesus? That's going to determine what you're going to let them watch, what you're going to let them listen to, um, whether or not you're going to make them go to church. Let me help you with that. If they live under your house, they should go to church. If not, you're going to give an account for that. You are. You absolutely are. Your children, if you're going to church to hear the word of God preached, they need to be there. Well, they don't pay attention. I don't care. I don't work on that with them, but they need to be there. They, they don't like it. Don't care. And you shouldn't either. They need to be there. That is part of your responsibility. You need to have them there. And so, so again, that's not because church saves them. Jesus saves them. Not church, Jesus. But, but you need to be there. The, the, the great analogy on this is, is, is all of these are opportunities for us to stack kindling around the hearts of our children. And then we beg the Spirit to light the fire. That's it. But your children desperately need Jesus. Number 10, finally, um, your, your children really need you. I just want to say that. Like, your children really need you. Some of you um, are like a stay-at-home mom, like my mom, and you're like... My children, that's all they've got is me. Like, I'm, I'm, um, did I say stay at home mom like my mom or stay at home mom like my wife? I'm not sure. We'll review the tape. You can figure it out. I meant wife. Um, and my, and, and my, my children have my wife all day. And, um, and I get home in what can be so easy. And this is a stereotype, but this can be so easy. I get home from a long day of work. And you know what I'm ready to do? Like, just check out and be done. Well, there's a bunch of problems with that. And one of those is, is that my children really need me too. They, they really need me. And I've learned over, the to, over, over time that I can be um, present uh, in the house, but not actually be present. Like I can be there, but not actually be there. And there's a bunch of us, I think, I think this is especially true of fathers. I'm not saying it's not there with moms as well. There's a bunch of us, though, that, that we work hard, which is good. You should, Dad. You should be working hard. But, but we work hard at the expense, and, and we'll pick up over time, and we'll work too long, and we'll do all those things. And we're doing them in order to provide for our families. But what our families really need is us. How, how ironic is it that you'll go work overtime to buy an RV? Nothing wrong with RVs, by the way. You'll work overtime to go buy an RV so that you can spend more time with your children. And you had to work a couple of hundred hours of overtime in order to afford it. And you use it three times a year, right? Now, whether or not an RV is a good financial decision for you is not even part of the conversation. The point is, is that what your children actually need is for you to not work overtime and for you to get home and be their dad. Forget about the RV. They don't need that. They're not going to remember the RV. They're not going to one day be like, Dad, thanks for the RV. The RV will not make the, 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 um, the same impact on them that your presence will. And so sometimes, you're going to love what I do here, sometimes we sacrifice presence and try to offset that with presence. Presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, presence, and, 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 and we don't give them that, and then we try to buy them with presence, with, with, with stuff. And I understand how that works, but what your children will need long after the presents, Christmas or otherwise, are at goodwill and back to goodwill again. Long after that's happened and then off to some landfill, long after all that, your children will have been moved and shaped by you being really present in their lives. And as parents, may God help us to be those kind of parents who leverage every moment that we've got, every moment we've got, for the sake of the glory of God, for the articulation and, and, and experience of our children as we pray that they believe the gospel. Um, let, let God help us be those, those kind of parents. Now, we're done. Uh, next week is going to be the most important talk of the entire Red Life. Okay, so I really need you to come next week. We're going to cover, um, we're going to, we're going to tie up all of the loose ends. I'm going to recommend some resources for you because I ran out of time today. And, uh, and, and next week will be vitally, vitally important. Before we get to next week, here's your homework. 
um, your homework is basically do everything I've said, if it's true, do everything I've said, and then go listen to every one of these talks. Because uh, they're all posted by now. You should be able to catch up on all of them. And um, it's really important that you do that because next week all of this comes together. And we really, really, um, next week is like the time for us to really begin to get a picture of, of experiencing like real profound joy in our marriage. And so um, so come next week and we'll, uh, we'll be ready to get to work. Okay, see ya.